we are just started sir please start you will be starting it you will be introducing no 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 sir we we are just live sir you just not yeah. shall i go ahead you will be shall i go ahead Ah, yes, sir. Be... yes, sir. Please. Okay. Sure. That's what I did. Right. So, good evening, friends. Uh, today we have this uh, talk on the future of mobility, and I wish to thank uh, NPTEL at the outset for hosting this talk. And uh, my name is Shankar. I work for Mahindra and Mahindra as the vice president for technology innovation. And uh, what I wish to share with you today is. Uh, brief overview of what the future of technology is going to be like and how you and i can prepare ourselves to participate in co-creating this uh, future mobility technology that's a plan for the day so with this uh, what i do is i'll share my screen so that i can very quickly take you through my presentation So I hope uh, you are able to see my screen. And um, today's uh, focus for discussion is the future of mobility. And I am Shankar Venugopal. So this is uh, the first in a series of talks that we have planned. And uh, this is um, from a bunch of experts, uh, technical experts from the Mahindra Research Valley based in Chennai. And uh, to start with, we have identified about uh, 10 topics that could be of uh, interest when we look at the future of mobility. And the very first talk is to give you a overview of the future of mobility itself. And uh, this will be followed by a few other topics which are all related to realizing the vision of a sustainable mobility for the future. And this would span across technology, innovation, design thinking, materials, electronics, a whole gamut of topics which should all come together in creating this uh, future mobility technology. So this is just the first in a series. Uh, to just to introduce myself, I'm a vice president for technology innovation and knowledge management at Mahindra and Mahindra. I'm also the dean for the Mahindra Technical Academy. And prior to joining Mahindra, I had worked for a few other organizations in technology leadership roles. And these companies include Cummins, Honeywell, Dow Chemicals, General Electric, and the Indian Space Research Organization. And by way of background, I am a PhD in material science. I did my PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and also did my management education from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. And um, I enjoy uh, technology innovation. I've been a prolific inventor with a uh, few granted patents and a few more patent applications in the pipeline. And I'm also, I enjoy speaking and uh, I'm a TEDx speaker. And uh, I enjoy specifically speaking on innovation related topics. And I really look forward to this interaction with you today. This is just a summary of my talk for those of you who missed the actual talk today and who want to refer to it later, I thought I'll just include a summary. But uh, since uh, I'm going to directly talk to you, we'll skip this chart and directly come to the core of the presentation today. So my talk I have structured in a way that the first part of the talk, the part A, will be introductory in nature. It will look at how is mobility technology today and uh, how do we create a vision for sustainable mobility for the future and also tell you about what are those disruptions that are shaping the future of mobility. This is the first part of my talk. When we look at how is mobility today, the very first 
topic that we need to address is to make sure that the mobility technology is absolutely clean. Today, we have vehicles which have a reasonable level of emissions, and we are looking at future technologies where we can achieve zero vehicular emissions. This is one of the very important goals that we need to pursue when we talk about future mobility. We want absolutely clean emission, no pollution at all from vehicles. And this is, I believe this is absolutely possible with through technology and innovation. So this is uh, the very first aspect of future mobility, making it absolutely clean. Second aspect is also to make it absolutely safe. Again, we have technologies with us which can make it absolutely accident free. So this is perfectly possible and we need to work towards this. And the third, of course, is something that you're all familiar with, which is the traffic jams, navigating to the dense city traffics. And it's very important for us to come up with technology-based solutions, which would help us to navigate through the dense urban traffic. So these are the three big challenges that anybody aspiring to make an impact in the mobility industry in this space should aspire to solve these three big problems and achieve absolutely clean mobility, safe mobility, also convenient in terms of the ability to navigate through dense traffic. I think these three will form three very important dimensions of the future mobility scenario. So when we talk about sustainable mobility, I'm talking about a mobility which is clean, which takes care of us, absolute safety, and is, which is also fast and convenient. This is what I have in mind. And I will take you through a bunch of technologies which will help us to achieve this. So when I propose a future technology, which is clean, safe, also convenient, I'm looking at a few technology disruptions that's happening around us in the form of electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and connected vehicles. And added to this is a business model disruption of shared ownership, or in simple terms, the Olas and the Ubers that we all use. So it is this combination of technology disruptions and business model disruptions that have the promise of building a sustainable urban mobility technology for the future. And a lot of my talk today will center around these disruptions, the three technology disruptions and the one business model disruption of shared ownership. And my own experience in these areas span across the working on electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and also connected vehicles. And uh, we also been working on vehicles that are suitable for shared mobility models. So I will, derive, I will derive some examples, case studies from this work experience that I have working in these technologies and products. Look at the picture before you. This is a person standing on a beach. It's a very calm and serene situation to start with. And then there is a huge wave which is approaching him. And this picture is representative of the disruptions happening in the automotive industry. Disruptions happen across multiple industries. And today I have taken the example of the automotive industry. And the disruptions, the magnitude of the disruption is shown by the magnitude of the wave that you see here. And the person standing on the beach, it could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody out there. But the, when the disruption of this large magnitude, we have very few options in terms of how we can react to it, how we can respond to it. So today I'm going to introduce to you some of those disruptions that are happening in the automotive industry, which in turn are shaping the future of mobility. And when I say that we have to prepare ourselves to handle these disruptions, the image that I have in mind is what you see here, this person, instead of standing meekly before that big wave, is actually picked up a skill 
that could help him to ride this wave. So we need to prepare ourselves to ride this wave of disruption. And the discussion today on the future of mobility will in fact be a starting point for each one of us here to build the necessary skills that we would need to ride this wave of disruption, the automotive industry. Friends, I'm sure you are very familiar with this picture that you see here. When you open the bonnet of your car, this is what you have been seeing for quite a few decades. So there is nothing new, there is nothing surprising in this particular image. And it's a very old familiar image. But you know that if you happen to open the front bonnet of an electric car, the image would look more like this than the previous one. All those components that you have seen in the earlier image do not exist in the electric vehicle. This happens to be a Tesla Model S electric car and most of the electric cars would be quite similar. So I showed this image just to tell you how much of a big shift it is to move from the internal combustion engine vehicle to a fully electric vehicle. It's a fairly big paradigm shift. It's a shift not only in terms of the design and operation of the vehicle, it's also a shift in terms of entire ecosystem built around the automotive product. Here you see the various automotive components. And when we talk about electric mobility and electric autonomous and connected vehicles, all these technologies coming together, we are also talking about building a whole new ecosystem of technologies and suppliers around these new technologies. So it's one of the biggest shifts that this automotive industry is seeing. So it is very important for us to be proactive in understanding what these shifts are and how we can actually contribute to making this transition happen. When you talk about rebuilding the auto component suppliers ecosystem, we are looking at certain systems which won't continue the new technology, which are like engines, clutch, radiators, gears, a whole bunch of mechanical systems which may not find a place in electric vehicle. There are also certain systems which will continue to be there, which will be the steering systems, the seats, brake lining, high headlights, leaf springs, shock absorbers. Some of them will definitely be there. So you would continue to see them. And also the introduction of certain new components like the batteries, the motors, wiring harnesses, inverters, microprocessors, more and more electronic sensors and controllers. So this is what I mean when I mention about rebuilding the entire ecosystem around that. All these are actually opportunities. If you are able to learn these new technologies proactively, then we'll be able to leverage all these big changes that's happening around us. So that, with that, I'm able to kind of introduce to you what is happening in the mobility space. Now I want to really shift gears and talk about the real action in terms of what should we do to realize the vision of future mobility? What are the challenges ahead of us? What are the bottlenecks? And what are the real opportunities that we have to make this happen? This is the second part of my talk. And I would like to spend a little more time on this part because this is something what, where we can do something about. So let's try to understand what are the challenges ahead of us. If you look at the adaption of electric vehicles, specifically in India, I can think of at least three big challenges. The first is the range anxiety. With electric vehicles, there is always an anxiety in the user's mind about the range of the vehicle itself. What will happen if I run out of battery power? And if I'm stuck somewhere, how do I manage? This is a big, big concern 
in the minds of people who want to adapt to electric vehicles. The second is the cost. Because the battery price today is expensive and the battery cost contributes to almost 40 to 50% of the price of the electric vehicle itself. So the price itself is the second concern. And the third one is the lack of fast charging infrastructure. We need to build a lot of fast charging stations across the country if you and I want to use electric vehicles in a hassle-free manner. So these are the top three challenges that we need to address in order to encourage the adoption of electric vehicles in India. Of course, the expectations and the needs of the customers from electric vehicles varies a lot from region to region. And this gives a snapshot of what the users ask for at different regions across the globe. And definitely, if you see the India, you would see that lack of electric vehicle charging infrastructure shows up prominently as a concern in the minds of the customers. So this is something that we need to address and we need to build a reasonably good infrastructure of charging stations, more specifically fast charging stations in order to help people adapt to electric vehicles. When we want to develop new products in future technology, future mobility space, one thing we need to ensure is that the technology is affordable to the consumers. And I already mentioned about the battery being expensive. So apart from the battery cost, there are two other areas that we need to keep in mind if we want to make the technology affordable. Second is the charging infrastructure. We need to make sure that we are able to build this charging infrastructure in an affordable way because we need lots and lots of these charging stations. So it has to be done in a very affordable manner. The third one, which is the LiDAR, that is more in the context of the autonomous vehicle. The LiDAR has been traditionally expensive and uh, that has been one of the concerns in the minds of people who are looking at practical applications of autonomous vehicles. And these three, the battery, the charging stations and the LiDAR, these three have been some of the areas where innovators have focused on to make the technology affordable. Once you make the technology affordable, it is also important to make sure that the new technology is sustainable. From this uh, perspective, I want to draw your attention to some of the critical materials that enable electric vehicles. You're all familiar with the lithium ion batteries that go into electric vehicles. Along with lithium, you also need cobalt. These are two very critical materials for the battery of the electric vehicle. And uh, we need to make sure that these materials are readily available when we scale up the manufacturing of electric vehicles. So we need to mitigate all the risk around availability of critical materials when we scale up electric vehicles. Also, there is a third material, the rare earths, which are the materials that go into the magnets, and these magnets make the electric motors very compact and efficient. So we need to look at these three materials, lithium, cobalt, and the rare earths. We need to understand their chemistries. We need to understand how to design products with these materials, because these are the building blocks of the future mobility. So it's all very exciting to talk about new technologies which are going to be a lot more sustainable, a lot more efficient, clean, and safe, and convenient. But it needs a mind shift for us to come up with innovative ideas to really participate in this creation of future technology. It is not sufficient if we come up with incremental innovation and incremental ideas. We need to really think exponentially to come up with innovative ideas and realize this vision of future mobility very quickly. So let me explain what I mean by exponential thinking. Here is where I want to share a small story with you to tell you what is exponential thinking and how different it is from incremental thinking. 
this uh, story goes back to the days when the chess when the game of chess was invented and the uh, inventor of the game goes to the king and demonstrates the game and the king is uh, very much impressed he is very happy and he says i want to give you a worthy reward and uh, what would you like to have and the inventor being a very wise man he says uh, give me a few grains of uh, wheat and uh, i'd be happy with that the king was surprised see i am ready to give you gold silver and what not and you are just asking for a few grains of wheat are you sure the inventor says yeah absolutely sure but in a particular way i want just one grain for the first square of the chess board and two for the second square 4 8 16 32 64 128 200 2024 2048 and so on the king did a quick math and said okay just a few grains of wheat it should not add up to much maybe about 10 bags of wheat that's fine it should be okay so he says fine you will have your reward and ask his uh, staff to go ahead and get him the wheat that he had asked for friends by now you would have guessed what would have happened so what the inventor asked for is 2 power 64 minus 1 which is a very very large amount of wheat so many million tons metric tons of wheat and if we compare with where we are today it is about 1645 times the global production of wheat in 2014 okay this is a really really large number and of course the king could not give the reward the inventor asked for and uh, what this tells us is when we talk about exponential growth the numbers to start with may be very small but it grows up and suddenly you will see mind boggling big numbers which you would have never even imagined why i am telling you this is because the technologies that we are going to use today to build products for the future mobility these technologies are growing exponentially that's the reason why i want you to appreciate the nature of exponential growth for example if i take 30 linear steps 1 meter each i'd have just walked 30 meters which is not much of a distance but instead of linear if i take exponential steps start with 1 meter and make it 2 meters 4 8 16 like that in 30 steps i would have gone somewhere around 25 times around the world try to imagine 25 times around the world in just 30 steps that's a kind of distance i would have covered when i shift from linear to exponential friends let me show you the technologies that are going that are really growing at this rapid rate these are just a sample of technologies which are growing at this exponential rate some of them are connected technologies some of them are cognitive technologies some of them are clean technologies but all these are exponentially growing and they are disrupting across multiple industries and i am sure you are using one or more of these technologies in your day to day life today it's not something new they are all very familiar technologies like mobile internet cloud artificial intelligence energy storage like the lithium ion batteries that i talked about advanced materials autonomous and near autonomous vehicles 3d printing many things i'm sure it's not new to you you have been um, you have been getting some exposure or the other to these technologies but what i want to remind you today is all these technologies are growing exponentially and we'll be using one or more of these technologies to build future mobility products and solutions that's why we also need to think exponentially it's very important if the technology is growing exponentially and you are only thinking incrementally that's not the best use of technology you also need to be in sync with the growth of technology that's why we all need to think exponentially big let me just also show you an example of what happens when multiple exponential technologies converge this is a small eight seater vehicle called oli 
And uh, this has been on the roads for about five years. This is not a futuristic uh, product I'm talking about. This has been on the road and been collecting a lot of data. And uh, this vehicle is um, 3D printed and made of uh, advanced materials that make it very lightweight. It is electric, it is connected, it is autonomous. And interestingly, though it is autonomous, it doesn't have any onboard intelligence as such. It has a few basic sensors and cameras, and uh, it collects information about the surroundings, and it sends this information to IBM Watson on the cloud. Watson processes this information and directs this vehicle either to accelerate or brake, turn left, turn right. With this kind of uh, architecture, this vehicle is able to navigate through dense city traffic. So this is what I mean when I talk about a convergence of multiple exponential technologies. So of the 12 technologies that I showed you, there are at least seven or eight technologies which have converged in this product that you see here on the screen. So friends, when multiple such exponentially growing technologies come together, things can change overnight. So it is very important for us to appreciate the power of the convergence of such disruptive technologies. This is very important. And all these technology disruptions that we talk about start with digitization, looking around and asking what has still not been digitized and how I can create value by digitizing. The initial results could be deceptively small, but suddenly it picks up momentum and then starts disrupting things around you. Once a disruption happens, you will see dematerialization. That is certain physical objects which you are familiar with may not be there anymore. Remember the vehicle, the, what was there under the bonnet for an IC engine vehicle was no longer there in the case of electric vehicle. So that's what I mean by dematerialization. Material things vanish. And then of course, there will be a demonetization because the cost associated with the materials, cost associated with manufacturing, marketing, a whole bunch of cost also will get knocked off when those physical objects, when they vanish, there is a significant cost reduction also. When that happens, there will be a democratization of technology. What it means is anybody and everybody will be able to access this technology. It will become so affordable and accessible that everybody will be able to de derive benefits from these new technologies. This is the nature of the transformation that we are talking about. And what I explained to you today is called the 6D transformational framework, where we talk about digitization, deception, disruption, dematerialization, demonetization, and finally, democratization. This is the way in which disruptions happen. It all starts in a small way, but ends up with making the technology accessible and affordable to every single person out there. We can see examples and evidences of this in the automotive space itself. I told you the battery is expensive. And the battery contributes to 40 to 50% of the price of the electric vehicle. But if you look at this data, you would see that in the last six, seven years, there has been a more than 70% drop in the price of the lithium ion battery. And the battery is expected to further fall in price the years ahead, making it a lot more affordable to a very large population of people. So this is uh, evidence of how technology is actually evolving in the direction to make it a lot more affordable. So this is just one example in the case of the lithium ion battery. Let me also show you what's happening on the LiDAR front. The LiDAR which is the eye of the autonomous vehicle has been evolving very rapidly over the last few years. If you look at the data from 2007 to 2017, you see that the size of the LiDAR has become very, very small and compact. You can actually carry it on the palm of your hand today. It's so small and compact. What I'm showing you here is a LiDAR from a company called Velodyne, and it's become very small and compact. And when it's becoming smaller and compact, what has also happened is this, the price of this LiDAR has fallen very significantly. 
it was about the $70,000 in 2012 and it became less than $1,000 and uh, in 2017 and people are talking about uh, LIDAR which is even sub $100. Okay? That is the rate at which the cost of the LIDAR technology has been falling. So from $70,000 to just $1,000 is a phenomenal, unimaginable shift. So these are the things that are really accelerating the evolution of the future mobility. The compound technologies are growing exponentially, not only in terms of the performance, their cost is also falling exponentially so that these technologies become affordable to a very large group of people. So now that we have talked about the various technologies, let us look at what is it that we need to do, okay? This uh, brings to our attention uh, a very important aspect, especially during this uh, lockdown period when we are all cut away from our offices, colleges, from our friends and all our colleagues. Sometimes we wonder what is it that we can do um, sitting at home, how do I innovate? How do I disrupt? What can I do? I don't have access to my labs. I don't have access to my library. What do I do? But friends, this is precisely the time for us to reboot, reinvent, and reignite. Early sometime in mid-March, Mr. Anand Mahindra gave an interview to Economic Times. He asked, can we use the lockdown period to look at our personal and professional way of life and ask how can we better serve the post-corona world? Can we use this downtime to actually introspect and figure out better way of doing things? Can we use the time available to us to come up with new ideas and innovations, to dream bigger dreams about the future and raise ambitions for the post-corona world? So what can we do? Can we use this time to actually reskill ourselves to prepare for the future of mobility and to serve the post-corona world? Can we use the crisis time to rebuild the entire ecosystem that's necessary for electric mobility in India? I also talked about some of the critical materials that are the building blocks of future mobility. So can we use this time available to come up with new ideas and innovations to recycle and reuse critical materials like lithium, cobalt, the rare earths, these are the materials that we need to scale up and sustain electric mobility. So friends, I would invite each one of you to use this time to actually reskill yourself, contribute to rebuilding the ecosystem for the future mobility, and also look at ways in which we can recycle and reuse the various materials that we need for scaling up the future of mobility. I think if you do these three things right, we'll be able to realize the vision of future mobility in India. This is very important. And this is an opportunity for each one of us to contribute to building the future of mobility. So for those of you who want to really take this discussion very seriously and do your own research and come start coming up with some ideas, I also included a small assessment quiz into this because it's going to be a series of talks. So it's always good to assess ourselves to see how much we have absorbed from these talks. So the assessment for the discussion that we have today are just five simple questions for which you can answer and then share it with the NPTEL. The first question is, what are the disruptive technologies and business models that are driving the future of mobility? The second question, what are the top three technology challenges to be addressed to realize electric mobility in India? The third one, what are the critical materials that form the building blocks of electric vehicles? Fourth one, what are the 12 disruptive technologies that I referred to? And finally, the fifth one, what are the six Ds of the disruptive transformation framework that I explained to you today? So friends, I look forward 
to hearing the response to this uh, five questions from you so that i will know how much of this has actually been absorbed by you that will also help us to plan the other talks in a more effective manner so with this i'd like to share my coordinates so that we can stay in touch if we have any other questions related to the discussion that we have today i have an active blog called innovation flow and you could also reach out to me on my email and uh, with this i expect to stay in touch with you i would uh, thank each one of you for attending my talk today and i would like to thank the organizers from nptel for hosting my talk today thank you so much with this i will stop sharing and i will look at what kind of questions you would want me to answer Can somebody read out the questions so that I can answer them? I see a few questions here. So let me try to cover all this. Um, give me a minute so that I go through a questions. If there are some common questions, I'll be able to address them together. There are uh, quite a few good questions, so I will very quickly answer these questions and for the rest, I will definitely send a more detailed response by email. Okay, so let me start with a few questions. One is about the charging infrastructure that I talked about. So somebody has asked about the possibility of wireless charging. Absolutely, it is possible to look at um, dynamic charging and wireless charging of electric vehicles. In fact, there are uh, pilot scale uh, experiments going on at uh, Tel Aviv in Israel and uh, Seoul in South Korea where typically there is a metal strip laid out on the road and the electric vehicle as it travels over it through induction, it gets charged. So the more the distance the vehicle travels on such a road, the more charge that it will accumulate. So this is quite possible and uh, the technology is uh, evolving and very soon we may be able to use such wireless charging technologies. It's quite possible. And uh, in terms of... Um, 
the biggest challenges for charging infrastructure in terms of technology and economics is another question. So for a country like India, we need to very quickly build um, charging infrastructure across. And again, when you talk about charging infrastructure, there are um, two types of charging. One is a conventional charging, which would take a few hours to charge a vehicle. Other is fast charging, where we are talking about maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes to charge the vehicle. So since we are all used to driving into a petrol bunk and driving out in five, 10 minutes, we would definitely look for fast charging options. That becomes very important for us to very rapidly build a network of fast charging stations. This is something very important. We need to start planning. The component technologies for this, if you look at, materials again will play a very key role in this. And also it is good to make these electric vehicles lightweight so that for the amount of energy available in the battery, they can travel longer distances. And the second is to have wireless on-the-go charging. And the third option that some people are looking at is also in terms of batteries that can be swapped so that you can quickly take out a battery that is drained out and replace it with a battery that is fully charged. So we have to look at various combination of various technologies in the early stages till we build a complete and very wide network of charging stations in India. So it will take some time to reach there. So some of you have had the opportunity to travel in autonomous vehicles. That's exactly very interesting. And I haven't, personally, I haven't traveled in autonomous vehicles so far, but what I have seen is autonomous tractor. That's what we have been focusing on. So we have looked at uh, semi-autonomous tractors, driverless tractors, which can work in our Indian farms. And that is the area that I'm very passionate about. And we have made good progress in terms of not only bringing in semi-autonomous features to these tractors, but also keeping them very, very affordable so that an Indian farmer can afford to buy and use an autonomous, a driverless tractor. So this is uh, my area of interest. I haven't actually worked on a driverless car. I only worked on a driverless tractor. There are a lot of questions about uh, building capability. If you want to, what kind of skills I need to build if I want to get into the automotive industry. The third or fourth talk in this series is going to be specifically on the skills that we all need to build if you are aspiring for building our career in the automotive industry. So just wait. The fourth talk in the series will address all your questions about building skills. Okay. So just hold on to a couple of weeks when you get to attend the fourth talk in the series. There is a question about future energy storage options. So I talked about only the battery. When you talk about energy storage, definitely there is a lot of work that's happening to look at beyond lithium. How can we come up with energy storage systems beyond lithium? And also with the relatively lesser cobalt. Since the lithium and cobalt price has been going up, people have looked at reducing the amount of cobalt. And I believe it's almost now one sixth of the amount that was used a few years back. So there has been good progress in that front. And there has also been a lot of research breakthroughs that have been happening on various other lithium ion battery systems like uh, lithium glass, lithium um, based systems where there is a relatively lesser amount of lithium that's being used. And uh, also there have been a few research groups looking at sodium ion batteries in South replacing lithium by sodium. So there is uh, definitely a lot of uh, active research that's happening in the space to look at energy storage beyond lithium. So maybe we could have one talk which is specifically focused on the battery systems, the various new chemistries, and what it takes to design these batteries. We'll keep that in mind because I see quite a few persons around the battery. So we'll plan a separate talk on this. Um, there are a few persons in terms of um, job opportunities in the space. Definitely, there are going to be lots and lots of new jobs when you talk about future mobility. But friends, to get those jobs, we need to acquire certain skills, which is a combination of mechanical engineering, electrical, 
electronics, and basic programming. We need to have a combination of all these skills to get these jobs in the future mobility industry. So the fourth talk will talk about in great detail all the skills that we need to acquire and also how to acquire those skills. So we will keep these questions for that session because I'll be addressing most of this in the talk. The future of automobile students, what is the future? Absolutely, it's going to be very bright, very nice with a lot of job opportunities and very interesting, very challenging work ahead. But again, you need to go beyond your classroom and pick up a lot of those newer skills that you need to work on these challenging problems. So that's if you are able to do that, then the future is very, very bright. How will, the how will be the future of R&D in automotive sector? And what an automotive enthusiastic graduate, BTEC Mechanical, do to enter into automotive R&D? So this is where I, again, talk about the skills. So hold on to the fourth talk in the series. We'll talk about a mechanical engineer. What are the additional skills he or she need to pick up to get into the automotive industry? OK, please uh, hold on. There are some questions about the use of phase change materials in battery thermal management. Absolutely. Uh, there are active thermal management and passive thermal management. And then phase change materials play a very important role. They can, uh, because controlling the temperature of the battery pack is very, very critical, very important to the safety. So phase change materials definitely will be a very important technology to look at when you talk about thermal management of the battery pack. Um, there are some questions about the pandemic and um, will, because of the pandemic, will there be a kind of a loss because less number of vehicles are selling and things like that? Yes, definitely. It had an impact, but uh, things are improving now. The sales numbers are going up and uh, things are again slowly getting back to normalcy now. So I think you should not worry too much about it. You should just Focus on rebuilding your skills during this time so that uh, you make the best use of this time. Industry would surely recover. And the pandemic, although there is a temporary impact of the pandemic, I'm sure the post-corona world will open a lot of newer opportunities. So just don't worry about this at all. Just focus and use this time to reskill yourself. There are some questions about cybersecurity in the case of a connected car, whether it can be hacked. See, this is definitely a very important uh, problem to be addressed by all automotive vehicle OEMs. Surely, yes, there is a lot of work that's happened to make the car absolutely safe and secure. Okay, When you talk about a connected car, so definitely there are a lot of technologies in place in the connected car to make sure that Nobody can hack and take control of the car. Okay, so don't worry. There are these problems have been uh, very well addressed, and uh, there are a lot of protective technologies in place to make sure that your connected car cannot be easily hacked. Sure, but it's all dynamic. Somebody may come up with yet another way to design it around. So there will be always some interesting new technology developments happening in this space. So if you have an interest in cybersecurity, Definitely, there is a lot of uh, such interesting jobs in the future mobility industry. So I'd encourage you to build those skills around cybersecurity. Definitely, that's an important area. There is a question on, can we develop electric vehicles on concepts of fluids? Actually, honestly, I don't understand the question. Maybe I'd like to, I, I, I see the email address of this person. So I'll reach out to the person to better understand the question before I try to answer that. Uh, there are some questions specifically about Mahindra recruitment process and jobs in Mahindra. We do hire a lot of young graduates and postgraduates every year. I'd be most happy to tell you how to apply for a job at Mahindra, but we can take it offline. Any other person, what will be the 
role of a mobility engineer in short and long term plans of e mobility engineer mobility engineer will play a very crucial role actually in building the economy of india because uh, mobility is a critical part when you talk about economic growth in the short term in terms of uh, electric vehicles and connected vehicles in the long term in terms of autonomous vehicles and uh, building an end to end solution see we talked about vehicles we should also talk about energy management because when we have so many electric vehicles and everybody is going to connect for charging at the same time we should also make sure that we are not overburdening the grid we should look at so uh, renewable sources of energy how do we manage the energy there is a lot of interesting problems to solve so mobility engineer will have a very interesting time and a very busy time in the long term so which will be at the interface of energy and mobility industry there is a lot of uh, good work to do ahead government policies absolutely there are a lot of very good government policies uh, to encourage electric mobility in india so it is um, you should, i would encourage you to look at some of the recent policies which have been announced by the government and uh, which are all uh, strongly encouraging the adoption of electric vehicles in the country and um, the tamil nadu state has recently launched the policy for artificial intelligence ethical ai and then for blockchain and for cyber security so i would also encourage you to look at these policy documents from the tamil nadu state and understand the frameworks so there is a uh, lot of good work happening both at the national level and at the state level to encourage the adoption of these new technologies current status of uh, electric vehicles in india we do have many electric vehicles being manufactured and available for you to purchase in india right now and each company like mahindra is steadily building their portfolio of electric vehicles so you would have plenty of options the days ahead if you want to buy electric vehicle so parallelly you also hope to build the charging infrastructure so that you will be able to use your electric vehicle without any trouble so then you will see lot more electric cars in the roads the days ahead there is a question about the materials availability i did mention that some of the critical materials have certain uh, challenges so we need to develop technologies which will mitigate the risk around availability of materials like lithium cobalt and there are others so definitely there are research problems to be solved there but overall scenario is very positive we'll have sufficient material to scale up the electric vehicle manufacturing in india that is not uh, something to worry about but definitely there are some research problems to be solved in those areas opportunities in ev for a new young generation the whole of the, the way i see the future is a combination of electric connected and autonomous so that's what you would all be using and that's what you will all be building so the the future is all about electric that way i'm not uh, really exaggerating but uh, that's a way in which the whole of mobility technology is evolving prices definitely it will come down because when i tell you the technology is exponentially growing the price of the technology also will fall exponentially i gave you a couple of examples of the lithium ion battery price and the lidar price so trust me all these technologies will definitely become affordable days ahead so don't worry because we have seen many such technologies which are initially very expensive within about a decade span they had all become affordable especially if you look at electronics and communication space it's so affordable today the same thing will happen in the mobility space also so just trust me all these technologies will become very very affordable this question on electronics automotive electronics we have planned a full uh, fresh talk on just the technology trends in the automotive electronics space so we will take some of these questions after the talk which is the eighth or ninth talk in the series is on uh, automotive technology trends so i think um, i will uh, stop at the stage in terms of answering the questions and uh, most of these questions have some emails along with so i will make sure that i respond to you by emails with the detailed answers and some links and references 
so that um, feel free to reach out to me if you want more information. That's the reason why I had included my email and blog on the last chat. So we will continue to interact through that. I really like the kind of questions that you have posed. It shows the amount of uh, interest you have in mastering this technology. I'm so happy to see this passion and enthusiasm from this audience. I really look forward to interacting more with you through the series of the other nine talks in this uh, talk series. I look forward to connecting with you again very soon. But in the interest of time, uh, I would stop now because it's uh, going to be seven now. So I don't want to spill over the time. So I'll stop here and I will assure you that you will get answers for your questions through individual emails going forward. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much.